So there's uh, four things that I think you need to know if you want to know anything about the functional anatomy of languages. Of course, there's a lot of things that you might want to know, and that's what you know, a good chunk of the talk is going to be uh, going to deal with. Here are the things. So just to preview for those of you who want to go to sleep or leave early, um, the four things that you that you need to know uh, are that language regions regions are not restricted to Broca's and Wernicke's area, the traditional language areas that we're familiar with. Uh, Number two, that the system is organized around two broad computational slash anatomic streams, uh, a dorsal auditory motor stream that whose primary function is speech production, uh, and a ventral auditory conceptual stream for speech recognition and comprehension. Uh, third, the, the idea that language is exclusively the pur purview of the left hemisphere is uh, incorrect. Uh, uh, hemisphere uh, dominance differs depending on the component of language you're talking about, most broadly Receptive functions, at least at the word level, are pre uh, predominantly bilaterally organized, whereas production is more left dominant. And finally, uh, something um, that I'll just hint at at the end, that the uh, frontotemporal language systems you can think of, I think, as uh, hierarchically organized, and I'll, that'll be the, the very end. Um, let's start with a classical picture. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, this is the classical view. This is a, 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 a cartoon from um, Norman Geschwin's 1979 Scientific American article uh, that identifies the two regions, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, in the left hemisphere with connections between them. Auditory information comes in, connects to, Broca, to Wernicke's area where comprehension happens. Uh, this is where um, speech programming happens here in Broca's area and it outputs into motor cortex. And that's basically the whole of the system according to this classical view. Uh, the modern view is a bit more complicated. Um, this is uh, just a, um, a map of regions implicated in using functional imaging, uh, implicated in language processing. And you can see that there's a good chunk of the brain. Notice that the left hemisphere is still uh, in, in this image. Um, here's what the map looks like if we're using a different method from cortical stimulation mapping, that is, Stimulating cortex and looking to see what kinds of language-related effects, either interruption or, um, or in generating certain uh, movements and so on. You can see that all these numbers correspond to the number of cases where something has happened uh, when you stimulate those areas. So it's not just Broca's and Wernicke's area. Um, this doesn't mean that the picture is just a, a complete mess. Um, and I w what I want to try to do is to um, give you a way of thinking about how this might be organized. And, my approach to this topic has essentially been top down. I want to kind of understand what the puzzle looks like and then start working on filling in the, the pieces. Um, the way I've approached it is um, somewhat unique, I think. And I've taken a kind of evolutionary comparative approach. And I want to um, present the logic behind this approach. Um, I've often said that I've learned more about language by studying vision than I have by studying language. And I want to explain uh, what I mean by that. Um, Comparative approaches are very common uh, in our field. Um, so in uh, 1981, Roger Sperry shared a Nobel Prize with uh, Hubel and Weasel. Uh, Sperry won for his discoveries concerning the functional specialization of the cerebral hemispheres. And uh, Hubel and Weasel won for their discoveries concerning information processing in the visual system. Of course, we're assuming that this applies to the primate visual system and the primate hemispheric specialization, including you and me. But of course, they didn't study, for the most part, humans. They studied, in the case of Spiri, uh, primates and other animals. Hubel and Weasel did their work in the cat. Um, they didn't win their Nobel Prize for understanding the cat system. And this, the reason for this should be fairly obvious when we think about it in these terms. And that is that uh, com by doing comparative research, we can take advantage of evolutionary uh, similarities in these systems um, that are often conserved, even following specific adaptive modification, as you see in different limbs that are, that are modified according to the particular needs of the organism. You can still see homologs, homologies between the components of the system. And, and therefore, it makes it reasonable to study uh, one model system in uh, making inferences about another. Um, can we use this for language? The language has been quite a problem in, um, in neuroscience research because it's often said that we don't have an animal model. It's true that no animal has human language. In a sense, it, it, lots of animals, almost all animals communicate. But uh, there's nothing like the complexity of human language that we, that we see. 
Um, but the interesting thing is that language emerged in a particular cognitive or neurocomputational context. So the very earliest estimates of the appearance of language is roughly uh, 1.75 million years ago. That doesn't mean full-blown language that we're speaking now. Uh, but the rudiments of human language uh, at, at the earliest um, emerged around this time point, um, which if you put that in the context of hominid evolution, you're talking about a group of primates that was very well developed from a cognitive uh, perspective in terms of the neural uh, components that are uh, operating in the brain. So it is safe to assume that these animals uh, had very sophisticated vision, hearing, motor control, memory, attention, categorization systems, very complicated brains. Language evolved in this context. So it's possible uh, that language, the systems that support language evolved de novo in their own specialized circuits. That's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. That's not typically how evolution works. It usually takes advantage of what's lying around and modifies it to a particular purpose. So, we should, if this reason is correct, we should expect to find some neurocomputational repurposing in the language system. That is, some homologs in linguistic and non-linguistic systems. This, is, this does not mean that I'm trying to reduce the complexities that we see in, in say, theoretical linguistics to something non-linguistic. I'm saying that there's some homolog in there that we might be able to use, um, that language could have evolved in. If you think about language itself, it is composed of all these things we're talking about. There's a perceptual component, there's a motor component, there's a memory component. Um, so you have a lot of these things that the brain is already doing for other purposes. So uh, I've called this a comparative computational neuroscience program. And basically the idea is we're not, we're using as our uh, model for language, not other lang language use in other systems and other organisms, but we're using similar computational operations in our own brain. So we're using our own brain, say vision or something else, to think about how language is working. That's the basic idea. Um, so there are some assumptions here that there, there will be some computational and architectural homologies. This could have failed completely, um, but the work that I've been doing um, suggests that there might be some truth to it, and that's what I want to try to convince you with some specific advantage, uh, um, examples. Uh, so my research program, the goal is essentially a unified model of language brain. That is, what is the information processing model um, doing? That is where we take linguistics and psycholinguistics and try to integrate that with a computational neuroanatomy. How does the brain implement this computational system um, in neural tissue? So my approach is to explore these homologies and to, to integrate theoretical frameworks and methods. And if this is successful, this will not only be useful for language, but it should be useful for other systems as well, say vision or motor control, because if we learn something in language, it should transfer back to other systems as well. So it, basically using language as a model system for, um, for brain function, it contains a lot of these things that a lot of people are studying. So here's the basic picture. So this is the broad framework uh, um, that has emerged out of this, and I'll explain more uh, in terms of why this seems to, to operate. It's fairly well established that the visual system um, is organized into two broad streams, a ventral sensory, uh, a ventral what stream, and basically this system is involved in identifying uh, what an object is, um, whereas the dorsal stream is involved in sometimes called the how stream, it's a, really think of it as a sensory motor stream that uses visual information to guide movements to interact with objects. Okay, so those are two different kinds of functions. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Fairly well established, established in vision. Um, the same architecture has been proposed for audition as well. So you see a conservation of this basic um, architecture and another sensory modality. This is an early version uh, that suggested that the dorsal stream is a where or spatial location processing stream, which is kind of where the visual stream started out as well before it got updated to a sensory motor stream. Um, and one of the things that I have done with my um, collaborator, David Popple, uh, over a series of publications starting in 2000, was to argue that language systems can be thought of in terms of this dorsal ventral split as well. And we proposed that uh, uh, you get a dorsal stream that is doing sensory motor integration for speech motor control, and a ventral stream that's involved in comprehending, recognizing, or compre comprehending the words and the meanings of, of the uh, speech that you're uh, processing. 
So let me just give you some uh, intuitive sense of what the differences between these two computational streams are. Um, you can think of what um, the brain has to do with sensory information in, in, in terms of two different kinds of tasks. So you have, to, you have to recognize what is being sensed, what's the content of the information. And you have to compute how to interact with it. These are fundamentally different tasks. So if you think about all these objects, they look pretty similar uh, from, a, you know, from a, a, a shape standpoint. And if you were going to reach out and grasp one of these things, it really wouldn't matter whether it was a Starbucks cup or a goblet or a vape or, or a trophy. Um, the, the motor task is the same, essentially. Um, but if you're going to recognize what it is, now it makes a difference. Uh, the, these are categorized conceptually as being quite different from these, even though they look almost identical from a shape standpoint. Those are the two kinds of things that the brain has to do with sensory information. Here's a couple of examples showing that you can get damage in these different um, cortical streams that produce deficits in one of these computational tasks but not the other. The first thing I'm going to show you is a case of visual agnosia. These are individuals who typically have ventral stream damage, uh, typically diffuse, typically bilateral, um, and have great difficulty recognizing what objects are. So he's going to be uh, shown a picture of a combination lock, and he's going to fail to come up with the, the concept for that thing. Not because he can't think of the name, but because he doesn't know what the object is. If you handed it to him so he could feel it and get it out of the visual system, he would recognize it and name it immediately. So it's not a language problem, it's a visu visual recognition problem. The really interesting thing about this is if you watch his hands while he's trying to come up with this, he will um, demonstrate a no the knowledge of what to do with it. I really at a loss. I, I can't. It just isn't making any sense at all now. I don't recognize it as a telephone. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize it as a lock? No, honestly, I don't. But it's just it. It does. It really looks very indescript to me. Uh huh. I but but your hands know what they want to do. I know, with it. and they want to do something. That's right. I can see them. <laughs> uh huh. You know, I can just picture them, and I okay. know that I have. It's like I'm undoing a combination lock. Good. Huh. Okay. Good. We had to work on that one, didn't we? <sighs> no shit. Yep, that was after about 10 minutes of struggling with this thing. He still, after he came up with the name, he still didn't recognize it. By the way, he still couldn't see it. He, but he cognitively figured out what it is based on what his hands were doing. So that's an interesting thing, that the hands or that dorsal stream that knows how to interact with objects can be preserved while the ventral stream or the ability to recognize objects is impaired. This is the reverse case. So this is a patient with unilateral damage to the dorsal stream. You can get bilateral damage, which causes a more complicated uh, uh, syndrome. She's affected only in one limb. So you'll see one limb is able to do the reaching task. The other one is having trouble, which tells you it's not a vision thing. Um, and it, although not demonstrated, she would be able to, if shown pictures of objects, name them and recognize them without any difficulty. Okay, so notice that she's, you would think if you just saw the left-handed grabbing that it's a depth perception problem, but her right hand is fine. She can nail, nail the action, no, no trouble. Um, but the ability to integrate information about size, shape, location is disrupted. And so she basically is groping around in the world to try to reach for objects. So that, that's what happens visually. Um, this is not a new idea. So the vision scientists are often credited with uh, inventing this idea or discovering this observation about, uh, about how the cortical system is organized. But this is a diagram from the 1800s from language research, which is essentially proposing exactly the same thing. You have an auditory center and a motor center and a connection between them. That's a dorsal sensory motor stream. And then you have an auditory center connecting to these B nodes, which is in this uh, uh, theory is representing a concept center. So you have essentially a, a, a ventral and a dorsal stream 
in language work. So there's a precedent for that. And I point that out because sometimes when I talk about this, this dual stream uh, model in language, they say that doesn't make sense for language. It just makes sense for vision. It's been around for a long time. How does this apply to speech? So why do I think that there is a dual uh, stream model that applies to language? Well, think about what the two kinds of things you need to do with speech information, the perceived speech information. On the one hand, you need to recognize what the word is that you're hearing. If I say cup, you need to recognize what it is. The other thing that you need to do, and this is the less obvious part, is be able to reproduce that sound pattern. Okay? You've already learned those words, so it doesn't seem like it's a relation between a sensory code for a cup and a motor plan for generating it. But think about the kid growing up who has to learn words, and they're hearing speech in their environment. They have to figure out not only to recognize what mom and dad or brother and sister are saying, what's the content of the, of the speech, but they have to figure out how to say that themselves. Oh, mom and dad says cup. I need to figure out how to make my mouth wiggle so that I can reproduce those sounds. That's essentially a sensory motor task because you're trying to hit an auditory target, the sound pattern for the words that you're hearing in your environment. So you can think about it in essentially the same way. These streams, so this is, this is the, our proposed um, neural architecture for this system. And basically, you have a dorsal stream that's going through this region here that we'll talk about and a ventral stream that involves these areas. Some of you might be saying, as uh, you, uh, Susan's discussion hinted, um, aren't perceptual and action uh, systems more tightly linked than we thought? Well, yes, they are tightly linked, but they're not necessarily tightly linked in the, in, in the direction of motor systems being involved in perception, which is basically what the mirror neuron claims uh, uh, held. So there's a, a version of this, uh, these kinds of observations which suggest that we understand action because the motor representation of that action is activated in our brain. There's a whole bunch of work on this. I could talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, if you want to uh, learn more about it, um, all of the details are, are here. Basically, what I'm going to be proposing uh, and trying to convince you is that these sensory motor interactions support speech production primarily, not so much the perceptual <laughs> side as the mirror neuron claims hold. Um, there are implications of that for the interpretation of autism in terms of the broken mirror theory, if you've heard about that that I can talk about at the end, if you like. Um, so I'll, I'll go over a little bit of the evidence um, that backs up my claim that uh, there's a distinction between these dorsal ventral streams um, that go along the lines that I'm suggesting, which this is involved in production, and this is involved in listening. So if you just look at a whole bunch of functional imaging studies, looking at blood flow, um, uh, what you find is that depending on the task, listening and comprehending versus speaking, you get a division that roughly falls out in terms of these dorsal ventral splits, um, which is consistent with this view. Um, some work that involves some folks here at Davis uh, showed that damage to the ventral uh, portions produce comprehension deficits, whereas damage to more uh, dorsal regions tend to produce uh, fluency deficits in speech production, so the lesion evidence supports that. We did a study uh, that examined um, the ability to uh, perceive speech, to recognize words in a task like this, where you had people uh, looking at a set of pictures, and then we would give them a word auditorily, like there, and all they had to do was point to the picture. Um, the manipulation we did here was these were individuals undergoing WADA procedures. That's when uh, people uh, are, have one hemisphere or the other anesthetized in, in preparation for surgery, uh, brain surgery. Um, and look to see what each of the hemispheres could comprehend in terms of you know, all by itself without the uh, help of the other. What happens on the production side is when you put the left hemisphere to sleep, the, the patient is essentially mute. There's no speech production at all. They just com go completely silent. If the mirror neuron theory were correct, that is, if we needed the motor system to perceive and understand speech, you would expect that that would produce a profound deficit in speech recognition. Um, and what our data show is that that's not the case. This is proportion of errors, and the error rate with left hemisphere anesthesia is quite low. Um, a little higher than the right hemisphere, so there is some asymmetry, but it's not that dramatic kind of thing that you would expect um, if you needed that motor system to perceive speech. So that's, that's a WADA study that we had done. Um, this is other stroke work that we're doing, um, which is looking at, um, in this case, uh, a praxia of speech, which is basically a motor coordination deficit. Uh, 
um, in acute stroke patients, and we're looking at the brain regions that are disrupted um, uh, in people who have apraxia of speech. And what you can see, not surprisingly, is that they're frontal motor related areas. Um, word comprehension does not involve this network. It involves more temporal lobe regions, certainly different than this distribution. Um, and repetition, that is perceiving and reproducing speech, involves something kind of in between, which is kind of what you'd expect if repetition is a sensory, immediate sensory motor task. And we'll come back to these data in a little bit. So here's kind of the, uh, the rest of the, the, the plan for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these things. Um, what we know is that these regions in the frontal lobe are critical for fluent production. This region that I'll spend some time on uh, in a minute is critical for repetition. That is, that's the region that is putting together the sensory and the motor parts. It's doing the transform between those representations. And these regions down here are important for comprehension. Um, and it's all kind of in the framework of this model. So here's, what, here's, here's the plan. These are the four remaining things that I'm going to talk about. We'll start with um, what's going on in this region, part of the ventral stream. And I'm going to suggest that these regions in the superior temporal sulcus, this yellow region here, are important for uh, perceiving, recognizing phonemes in the context of word comprehension tasks. Now, traditionally, the right hemisphere has been the neglected hemisphere in terms of language um, research. And most people these days would uh, acknowledge that the right hemisphere has some role to play in high level language things like discourse and things like that. That's fairly well accepted among language researchers. What's a little more controversial is that low level <laughs> language things having to do with say phonology or, or the perception of phonemes or individual words involves a substantial contribution from the right hemisphere. Um, some of the motivation for this view comes from relatively recent neuroimaging studies. This is one from 2000. <laughs> The compared listening to uh, different speech samples, let's see if it'll play. Nope, I have to click it. Um, it compared listening to clear speech. The police so you heard that. With, with acoustically manipulated speech sounds that um, were either intelligible, like so called noise vocoded speech, it sounds like this. A lot of the acoustic information is removed, but it remains intelligible for, uh, for people who are trained on this method, compared with unintelligible speech, which is uh, spectrally rotating it. You're going to think you understand this, but I'll show you that you, it's just because you've heard what the sentence is. So here's what rotated speech sounds like. So you think you can hear it, but if I put it out of context, so here's another rotated sample without knowing what it is, see if you can recognize it. I doubt any of you got anything there. If I play it for you in clear speech, and if I replay this one, now you can kind of hear it. So basically, they contrasted um, clear speech, intelligible speech, that is these yellow ones, with unintelligible speech. This is a, another version of it, and found a single left dominant activation site in the anterior temporal lobe. And so this was the uh, claimed identification of the pathway for intelligible speech in the left temporal lobe. And if you look at some recent review chapters even, um, speech sound recognition is localized in these models to a left, lat left lateralized region in the human brain. Um, this is, this is um, incorrect. If you redo this same experiment with the intelligible and unintelligible speech, which we had done about 10 years after the original study with more subjects using functional MRI, the previous one was PET, this is a more sensitive method. What we see is, in fact, that you see that left anterior region, but you also see lots of right hemisphere activation as well. So it's not as left dominant as you'd think. Uh, other experiments that we've done suggest the same sort of thing. So if we look at the perception of syllables compared to various acoustic controls and plot the activation locations across multiple studies, this is the pattern you see. It's not left dominant. It is bilaterally distributed. Um, this is another experiment that we did that basically used a kind of um, psychological smart bomb approach to identify the region that's involved in controlling phonological information. We manipulated what's called phonological neighborhood density, uh, words that sound similar to other words like um, uh, cat sounds similar to rat, hat, sat, and that's a dense phonological neighborhood. Turns out your brain has to work harder to process that because it has a lot of competitors compared to, say, orange, where there's not very many words that sound similar. 
And we looked for regions that activated more under the harder condition in terms of recognizing the sound patterns. And we found, again, bilateral uh, regions in the supratemporal sulcus. We've also seen some uh, individual case studies of patients with relatively rare, it turns out, lesions in the anterior temporal lobe, exactly these regions that some think are involved in speech recognition. And we look to see whether they have speech recognition deficits. Here is such a case. Uh, and we find word comprehension is perfectly fine. Syllable discrimination, that is telling the difference between ba and pa, perfectly fine. Uh, sentence comprehension a little impaired, which is kind of interesting. We'll come back to that a bit later. So speech recognition seems to be perfectly fine um, after these sorts of lesions. Uh, and then remember that you can take out the entire left hemisphere um, and still uh, comprehend uh, words uh, at above chance performance, well above chance performance, especially at the phonological level. So, um, so that's basically that the bilateral organization is speech recognition system. So that seems to be more bilaterally organized than we thought. The production side is more left dominant. So when you have left hemisphere damage and aphasia, you will typically have some speech production related problems. So that is one of the four things that I thought you should know about. The next thing I'm going to talk about is this area right here, which is an area that we got to name because uh, we were the first to discover it. We called it area SPT uh, for Sylvian parietal temporal. That just respects, uh, reflects its location in the brain. It tends to be left dominant. What is it doing? Well, here's the basic idea. We had, using the sort of logic that I um, articulated earlier, that there must be some kind of an interface between auditory speech and motor speech. Therefore, there must be some sort of a dorsal stream. We hypothesized the existence of a cortical system that was doing a, what we refer to as a coordinate transform, taking auditory format representations and converting them into motor format representations to reproduce those sounds. So we hypothesized this existence. And then in my lab, I went looking for it. Um, we, uh, we used, again, a visual homologue, uh, a monkey visual motor uh, kind of model to guide our search. And it turns out that in the intraparietal sulcus of the macaque, you find a bunch of areas here that are involved in visual motor transformation. That is, these are areas that are involved in taking visual features and uh, uh, changing them into motor plans for interacting with those objects. Uh, they're organized around motor effector systems. So some are involved in grasping, others are involved in uh, controlling eye movement, so the, the motor effector matters. Um, if you record from the cells in these areas, uh, you find that they have both sensory and motor response properties. That is, they'll respond during viewing of the object that they're about to grasp, say, as well as during the actual reaching, during the motor part. Um, and they're densely connected with frontal motor areas that are involved in controlling the actual articulator. So when we went to look for a similar region or a kind of region that's doing this interface, for speech, we looked for areas that were responding both during the perception of speech and in the production of speech. And that would be our first pass kind of guess as to what, as to a region that was doing this. One of my graduate students was in charge of this project, and this is the basic design we use. We present uh, auditory speech, in this case, three nonsense words for a few seconds. Then we have people rehearse silently to themselves, so there's no auditory input at all. Um, the same three words, and then a tone tells them to stop rehearsing and then they rest. And we expected to see three patterns of activation in different brain regions. This is a functional MRI study. We expected to see an auditory pattern in which the uh, brain, portions of the brain, like an auditory cortex, responded to the listening, didn't care much about the silent rehearsal, uh, and then responded again during the tone. So we found this pattern in the brain. We also expected a, a more motor type pattern in which it wouldn't care regions that don't really care about the listening part, but do care during the rehearsal part. That would be the more motor pattern. The one we were interested in, uh, based on the monkey work, was these sensory motor regions that respond during the auditory uh, listening part, as well as during the rehearsal. It doesn't go back to baseline and only drops back off when they stop doing this motor task. And these regions we found, these are the red areas here, include some motor areas. So if we think in terms of mirror neurons, people liked this when they first saw me talking about this, if they like mirror neurons, because here's a region that's responding during perception. Um, but that wasn't how I interpreted it. This is the region that we focus on because this was often the most robust region in the brain, and it corresponded roughly in location to those parietal monkey regions. So it kind of made sense anatomically that it might be doing the same sort of 
auditory motor transformation. Here's what the responses look like. Uh, you get, here's a listening, a rehearsal, another listening, and then a rest, and you get the listening. You get a little a dip here during the rehearsal, uh, and then a, a blip back up during the listening, and then it comes back to baseline. If you look at purely auditory areas, you can see it's just an auditory response, no difference in the response during the rehearsal and the resting. So this, this is basically what we've argued is a, an auditory motor response. Turns out it doesn't have to be speech. If you ask people to just listen to a novel melody and imagine humming it, you get just as much activation. So it's not speech per se, it's auditory vocal track coordination, in, in basically. Um, this, the response um, profile in this SPT area is really strongly correlated with the response in an area that's known to be involved in speech production. That is, it's connected to motor areas, and if you look at DTI or do some track tracing using uh, uh, MRI scanners, using this SPT region as a seed, you can find connections between S the STS region that I've already argued is involved in speech perception and motor areas that are doing speech motor control. Um, we wanted to look to see how specific this was to the motor effector. Is it just vocal tract or is it any kind of auditory motor uh, mapping task. And so we had skilled, knowing that it responded to music, we brought in skilled musicians and asked them to listen to novel melodies and either imagine humming them, that's the vocal motor output, or imagine playing them on a piano. And we found in SPT that the activation during the humming was much higher than during the playing, suggesting some motor effector selectivity, just like is seen in the monkey work. The location is interesting. It's right at the back of the sylvian fissure. Um, if you look at the cytoarchitectonics of this region, oftentimes researchers will consider the planum temporale, which is implicated in all sorts of uh, disorders like dyslexia, uh, schizophrenia, and so on. People think of this as an auditory area. It's not entirely. Only about the first half of this region is auditory. This portion back here, referred to as TPT, seems to be transitional and actually looks a lot like the cytoarchitectonics of this motor area. So more evidence pointing to this not being so much an auditory thing, but an auditory motor uh, kind of thing. The question, so the, we're doing a lot of work just trying to work out some of the anatomy, and people kept asking me, will you say sensory motor transformation or coordinate transfer, what's it actually doing? What do you mean by that? And I didn't know, so I said I don't know. Um, but We've finally gotten around to, to working on that a little bit, and that's what I want to give you some of the flavor of um, what we think is actually going on. What's it actually doing? Um, mo so I'm going to give you a little mini tutorial on motor control, because what I've done here to try to think about what this region is doing is I've looked back at how motor control works. So at some level, this is a motor control task, right? We're taking auditory sounds, and we're trying to hit those auditory targets with our motor speech acts. We're trying to produce a sound pattern, okay? Um, if you look at motor control, it's really all about hitting sensory targets. We don't just reach randomly. We reach to produce some sensory state, either to possess a cup or to alleviate some pain that we're feeling or something. We move to change our sensory state. It's all about hitting sensory targets. Um, this is actually an interesting problem. This is the simplest motor control model we can imagine, that there's some controller, something that's generating the movements. Um, it, we think of it as, say, motor cortex, that's producing a movement in a motor effector, like the limb. That produces some output which has sensory consequences. When you move your limb, you can see it moving with your visual, visual system. You can feel it moving because you have proprioceptive feedback. Um, it turns out that this sensory information is critical for motor control. We often think of the motor system as being the motor part, the front of the brain that's doing the action, but it doesn't work on its own. It can't work without sensory information. Um, the sensory information specifies the target of the action. Which thing are you going to reach for? Where is it? Uh, what's its orientation? You can't do that in a motor representation alone. And it specifies the current position of the effector. Where is my arm right now such that I can move it to, to hit my target? Um, so here's the problem. And it's an interesting kind of engineering problem with motor control that you would never think of because we do it so effortlessly. As you're reaching for something, sometimes our reaches are not perfect. They're, in fact, oftentimes there's errors in the reaches. So, and we want to, to make corrections for those errors. But that's a difficult problem for the brain to deal with. And here's, here's why. As you're reaching for something, suppose you're slightly off in your reach, and you're detecting that 
that shift. Oh, I'm feeling like my limb is going offside, or I can see that it's not going to hit the target, and you want to send a correction. That information about the, about the error in your reach has to get processed by your visual system or through the somatosensory system. Uh, that takes some time. And then it has to, you have to compare that, that um, error with some reference and then make a correction and then send that correction signal back out in the limb. All of this takes time. By then, the limb has moved. You know, this could take 200 milliseconds. By then, the limb has moved somewhere in the future. So how does the brain know to detect what to do with information that is effectively getting from the past, because it takes some time for it to get up here, and make a correction in the future? That's a very difficult problem. It's almost like trying to drive by just looking in the rearview mirror of your car. You can imagine doing this, black, on the, black out the wind, windscreen, and just look out the rear view mirror. You could probably get home if you did that. It would, you would have to go really slow, and you might hit something. So this is not an efficient way to do it. Looking in the past to make corrections in the future is not a very efficient way to do it. And in fact, when you build robots that have an architecture as simple as this, you get kind of these herky-jerky kind of things that don't work very well. So how did the brain solve this problem? Basically, the brain simulates the movement of the effector as a way to solve this problem. So you have a controller. It's controlling a motor effector. A copy of this motor command is sent to what's referred to as an internal model, which basically simulates the movement of the effector. Now the brain knows where the limb is based on its past experiences with movements and, and the feedback that it causes. And that allows this feedback loop to be much more efficient it's basically saying it's basically providing a proje projection screen on the win on the windshield telling you where you are so that's a very effective thing you use overt feedback to train the internal model uh, and then once you have that you can predict the current state of the motor effector and the sensory consequences of an action so it's actually quite useful so what about speech what's the sensory target for speech it's a little bit different because if you think about say producing a syllable like cat there's no error to correct. If I make a mistake and say rat, it's like a dart. Once it's out there, there's no way for me to correct it. Um, the best you could do is say, oh, that was a mistake. I need to correct it the next time. Um, but what's interesting is that sensory feedback um, can be used for correcting an error internally. So let me just give you an intuitive sense of what I mean by this so you can kind of grasp the concept. So uh, name this instrument for me, anyone. Ukulele. So most of you will pronounce it like this, ukulele. What does that mean that you pronounce it like this? You've heard that as the way to pronounce this instrument. Um, you've stored that in your auditory system, presumably, as the appropriate name for that thing, and now you're reproducing it. Suppose now I tell you that you're wrong, that the, the way that the people who uh, popularize this instrument pronounce it is ukulele. So now what I've done, I've given you a new target. I've changed your sensory target, and now I can ask you to say it properly, according to the way they say it in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, some of you failed. Um, <laughs> you, eventually, if you practice, though, so you might have noticed if you tried to say that, or if you tried to say any foreign word, you know what it's supposed to sound like. But when you generate it, it's like, oh, I've missed. I better keep practicing. So essentially, you've got the target, which is different from the motor plan. And you, through training, practice saying that over and over again, you learn to hit the target, just like you can learn to throw a dart and hit a dartboard and so on. So that's basically how I think of these sensory targets for speech. They're stored representations of the auditory targets for our speech that we're generating. Um, so there's, it turns out there's lots of evidence that auditory information is critical for speech production. So for example, if you've ever been on a bad phone line where you're getting an echo of your speech, it makes it very difficult to talk. It interfere, what you're hearing interferes with your speech production. Um, there's other examples from so-called, I won't go into it, but pitch shift reflex and F1 shift compensation. Um, we know that if you go deaf late in life, your articulatory speech system kind of declines over time. You need that auditory feedback to keep this system tuned. You can't just rely on, on the motor system. Um, so for speech, just to summarize, auditory experience provides the sensory targets. I gave you a new auditory experience. You have a new sensory target stored in auditory cortex. Overt feedback, when you try saying it, is a way of training the internal model. Oh, I said ukulele. That's not right. It's ukulele. So now you can, over time, train that internal model and figure out what movements will produce the right uh, consequence so that you're hitting the targets appropriately. It doesn't help much, of course, with correcting already executed speech acts. 
But the internal feedback can be used to detect and correct errors before they occur. So that's interesting and not something that the motor control people talk about. Um, and let, let me illustrate. So here's the kind of model that I've been developing. Basically, um, motor plans, so he here's the idea. You have a word that you want to say. Let me go to my example. You have a word that you want to say. So this is kind of like an abstract word. Say you want to say cat. Uh, what you do is you activate at, this, at the same time the auditory target, your memory for what that word is supposed to sound like, while you're activating in parallel a motor plan. You've said it before, so you kind of know what the motor plan is, and you activate it directly. Once you do that, you have a cat representation, or an auditory representation of the target, and a motor plan. Suppose the motor plan starts going wrong. You make an error, like you make an error in reaching. You start planning the wrong set of sounds in the auditory system. What this system does, basically that internal model, can say, all right, since you know this mapping based on experience, what you can do then is compare the plan that you, you're developing in your brain but haven't yet produced against the target. So you generate a prediction. This is called predictive coding. Um, and you can see, is this going to actually hit the target before you speak? If there's a mismatch, then you can generate an error signal and correct it before you speak. And what I'm suggesting is that we do this all day long, that a lot of times you're generating incorrect words in your motor system that your sensory motor system through this area SPT is picking up and correcting before you ever speak. Some, it's not perfect, sometimes we make speech errors, but that's basically um, what's going on. Um, so that's an interesting idea, but is there any truth to it? Um, in fact, there is evidence from uh, a syndrome called conduction aphasia that is explained nicely by this assumption. Okay? So conduction aphasia uh, uh, is a syndrome uh, in which patients have good auditory comprehension. Their output is, is disordered. They make a lot of speech errors, particularly at the phonological level. And they have some, some naming difficulties. It's particularly difficult um, for them producing long words and, or in repeating non-words. So I think of conduction aphasia as essentially the speech analog to optic ataxia, which is a dorsal stream sensory motor deficit. That's how I think about it. If that's true, and if I'm right that this region, SPT, is the thing that's doing the sensory motor transformation, then conduction aphasic should have deficits, or should have lesions involving SPT. So we did a study involving some folks up here. Um, that you may recognize, uh, where uh, in Nina Dronker's lab, she had a group of 16 conduction aphasics, and my uh, same graduate student, who was by then a faculty member at, uh, in Toronto, um, took their scans and aligned them up and overlapped the lesions, and that's where the lesions are. Here's data from functional imaging studies um, in 102 cases. We had done a bunch of these experiments, so a nice big sample, and here's SPT. And these overlap. In fact, the region of maximal overlap between the two patterns is sitting right there in SPT. So that's nice suggestive evidence. We've done some prospective studies. If you remember, I showed this. So repetition, conduction aphasics have a lot of trouble repeating speech. Um, and in fact, if you map the lesions in a large sample associated with speech repetition deficits, forgetting about conduction aphasia, just where are the lesions when you find people with brain damage who have trouble repeating? they end up lining up pretty nicely with SPT. So how does this model that I've kind of walked you through with the examples explain conduction aphasia? Well, mo a lot of the time when you talk to a conduction aphasic, they'll get fluent speech out without much difficulty. Why can they get fluent speech out? Because they've got this mapping intact. They can activate previously learned motor plans and generate speech just fine. When they make an error, it's because sometimes things go wrong when you're planning motor acts, there's no way for them to catch it internally. So it just comes out. Uh, and you get an increase in the phonological error rate, or an increase in the phonemic paraphasias. But when they say it, since they're also correctly and normally activating their auditory targets, they can detect the mismatch only when it comes out of their mouth, not internally. And they're like, cool, no, it's not that. And then they try again. They can't typically correct it effectively because this pathway is interrupted, and so they just do this repeated self-correction, often unsuccessful. Um, so that's basically how this uh, explains um, uh, conduction aphasia, which turns out to be hard to, to explain if you don't have a model that looks something like this. Um, we've, we've worked a little bit harder in, in expanding this model. So if you know anything about motor control or sensory systems, you know that they're hierarchically organized. So the idea that there is one 
sensory motor circuit with SPT being the only thing involved is probably a little bit naive uh, because we know these things are hierarchically organized. So I've taken some steps in trying to sketch out what other levels of organization there might be in terms of this. And the one that, where there seems to be some uh, decent evidence is a lower level uh, system that is involved in coding speech acts in terms of somatosensory targets. So the way to think about this, or the way I think about this, is when you're generating a syllable, say cat, you have an overall plan. And that involves a bunch of different gestures in your mouth. You have to close and open and close again. Uh, different tests. So you can think of opening and closing as consonants, vowels, consonants, vowels. Um, at a lower level, you're not planning this whole chunk, say a full cycle. What you're planning is a particular closure, say. And the target for that movement is a lower level target, like the feeling of your two lips coming together, or a particular proprioceptive position in your vocal tract. So you can think of the lower level as trying to hit sen uh, somatosensory targets. The motor plans are probably being coded up in, say, primary motor cortex or maybe uh, Bronman area six or premotor cortex. And there's some evidence that the thing in between, the analog to SPT, is the cerebellum, um, which is a lower level motor control because you get cerebellar damage can produce some speech deficits as well that appear lower level, not so phonological. So this is one way that we've been developing this model a bit. Um, and some of the evidence about the cerebellar stuff that I won't bother you with at this stage. Um, there is a little bit of evidence. So here's some evidence from our own work showing that the somatosensory system is important for speech motor planning. So again, this is the same data I showed you before uh, in which um, the uh, lesions associated with apraxia of speech, a motor planning disorder, um, are mapped with the, in a group of acute stroke patients. And you see the, you, the expected motor areas but you also see this uh, somatosensory cortex being implicated, suggesting that somatosensory cortex is playing a role in apraxia of speech, which is not necessarily something you think about. Um, let me just tell you about this one thing. This is, this is a, a, a little bit of a, a collaboration that we've been doing in patients with cerebellar damage to assess the idea that there are these parallel hierarchically organized uh, sensory motor circuits. Um, this, this involves a pitch perturbation experiment. So the typical, uh, there's an interesting paradigm that speech scientists use to study the effects of motor control on speech. Essentially what you do is you have people phonate a vowel, and you just say like, ah, and then about half a second through, you, you, you record that sound, they're sitting there with headphones, you modify the pitch of it and play it back to their ears. So to them it sounds like, what they're doing is going, ah, uh, uh, and then it goes low. So it sounds like your voice is being fed back. It's being fed back altered. What most people do reflexively is alter, uh, is compensate for that in their output. So if you hear your speech going low, you will raise the pitch of your voice to compensate for that. So this is the actual heard speech. You see it's coming in zero uh, perturbation. And now you get this shift. Uh, and this red line shows what's actually produced. So subjects will compensate for that. That's the basic result. Um, if you study individuals with cerebellar damage, so if the cerebellar, if cerebellum is involved in sensory motor control on some level, we might expect to see effects. And what we thought initially when we did the study is that people would not be able to compensate. Cerebellar patients would not be able to compensate. In fact, they overcompensate. They produce more of a response, which is kind of interesting, not so much what we expected. Um, and that raises some questions. Why are they overcompensating? And there's a couple of different ideas. One idea um, is that it's just broken and something weird is happening and the system is having trouble. Another possibility that we wanted to explore was that if you think about what's happening in this basic task, you have two sources of information that guide your ability to control your pitch. Okay? One of them is auditory, and that's being shifted. But as you're generating a vowel saying, ah, uh, you know what it feels like. You know what your larynx should be, should be feeling like in terms of the tenseness. That is staying constant. So this shift is being modulated by the auditory feedback, but it's in competition with the somatosensory feedback, which shows no shift. So you have these competing feedback circuits, which essentially map on, if I'm right, to these two circuits. So maybe what's going on in the cerebellar cases is if this really is the cerebellum, you damage this. Now you've taken away that one of the competing sources. You've taken away the somatosensory feedback. They're entirely dependent now on the auditory feedback, and so they overcompensate. They don't have anything to modulate or control that auditory response. 
And so we wanted to test this. And basically, the way we decided to test it was to see if masking the auditory feedback would actually improve the cerebellar patient's behavior. We modified the task a little bit. I think we just used a pitch tracking task where we had them try to um, hum a pitch that they were listening to. So they might hear, uh, here's a case where there was a rising pitch. So you can imagine a task where you hear a like that, and you just have to follow it along with your voice. Okay? And it either goes up or it goes straight or it goes up a little bit or down and so on. This is what happens in uh, healthy controls. So you see in clear trials, that's just the normal task, and when their auditory feedback is masked. So, and they don't really differ much. They're able to track the pitch because you know how much to tense your vocal, your, your larynx to generate an appropriate pitch. Cerebellar patients in clear trials, so they're listening to their own voice as they're trying to track this pitch, is going all over the place. And you see that there's some success um, out here, but it's really noisy. Turns out when you ask them to do the same task, but you don't let them hear their voice, um, they get quite a bit better, suggesting that the auditory feedback is really pushing them around, which is consistent broadly with this sort of model. So we're working on testing this, this model in more detail, but this was one of the initial forays into this. Um, okay, so the last main topic I was going to talk about is, is stuff that's going up in the anterior temporal lobe, which is an area that I won't spend too much time on. Um, that has been implicated in aspects of language processing. I've been talking about language as if, in terms of the neuroanatomy, as if language was entirely composed of syllables or maybe words. It's obviously much more complicated than that. Uh, in fact, probably one of the most interesting aspects is syntax and the higher level stuff. Um, so uh, for you language people, sorry. Um, but uh, it, it turned out to be very difficult to identify regions in the brain that are associated with these higher level processes. And the one area that's gotten the most attention is this area here, Broca's area. I think it's completely misguided, or at least largely misguided. Uh, I won't talk about why. What I do want to highlight, though, is this other area that we never thought played a role in language, that it seems to be doing something important at the combinatorial level, or at combining sentence structure with meaning. Some of the first clues was an early PET study that compared listening to stories in a language that you don't understand, in this case, French speakers listening to Tamil, lists of French words, and you get this pattern of activation. Broca's area starts activating. Sentences with pseudo words, kind of the same thing, except you get this anterior stuff. Pseudo words are but nonsense, kind of jabberwocky sentences. Uh, here's semantically weird sentences and the same pattern, and then a full-blown story in French. What was interesting is that the three conditions with sentence structure uh, something more complicated, activated this anterior temporal region bilaterally. Um, Broca's area didn't just turn on in those more complicated things. It turned on when other interesting things were happening, but not as a result of just listening to the speech. Uh, work by Nina Dronkers, uh, some of the early work there, suggested that damage to this anterior temporal region was associated with uh, sentence level processing problems or comprehension problems, so there was some lesion evidence to back it up. Um, some contradictory evidence, so I don't just want to present a, a story that is consistent with my ideas, is semantic dementia, which involves damage to anterior temporal regions or dis, uh, atrophy in anterior temporal regions, but seems to have sentence processing spared. Um, so this is, this is a, a piece of data that doesn't quite fit the story, um, but there it is. Uh, one interesting thing about this result, which I've shown you already, is this anterior temporal region um, seems to activate well to sentences, as I showed you. And it turns out that in these sorts of experiments, sentence stimuli were used. So that kind of makes sense. So the question that people have been working on uh, recently is whether we're talking about sentences, that is something about the syntactic structure, or is it really semantics? Is it something higher level, which is what the semantic dementia work seems to suggest? Um, and we can't really tell because when you're processing sentences, that also involves semantics. And the answer seems to be, so we did some experiments to try to get at this where we presented sentences uh, compared to unintelligible sentences. And there we got that anterior temporal region you see bilaterally. And then we took the sentences away and just presented words to see if that anterior temporal region would go away in the activation. It does not, but it gets weaker. Okay, so um, that's not the, the whole story. And in fact, it's interesting if you look at the differences between the anterior and the posterior temporal lobe activation to, in these conditions. Um, for words, so this is anterior uh, non-words. This is rotated 
uh, words and rotated non-words, and um, these is just kind of a weird condition. It activates mostly when there's some content, non-words, some word-like stuff, and then drops off when it just sounds like speech, just speech without much content. Whereas the posterior region seems to show a more graded response. And so one way we're thinking about interpreting this is semantic content seems to be driving this region mostly uh, for the most part, and it shuts down when there's not much semantic content, and whereas the posterior regions is doing something more phonological. That's, that's the idea. So the answer to this uh, seems to be that, it's, yeah, it's doing something combinatorial, something meaningful, which connects it reasonably to the semantic uh, um, dementia literature. Sentences are very rich in their semantics. They're combinatorial and may drive the system a little bit more. This is um, uh, basically the kind of uh, reasoning that several people have suggested. So um, I've talked about these four things. I want to end on this. And this is just kind of speculation, but it's based on eyeballing the neuroimaging and the lesion data. Um, if you look at regions that are implicated in different levels of language processing. So if you look at regions implicated in semantics broadly, you'll often see regions down here in the temporal lobe, sometimes extending up here, sometimes extending up here, and involving typically more anterior frontal regions. Um, some people focus on this and call it semantics. Some people focus on this. Um, but those are kind of the regions that get implicated. If you start talking about phonological level stuff, you typically see two kinds of areas being active um, or being involved. This posterior superior temporal gyrus region that we talked a little bit about uh, and a more uh, posterior frontal region. Um, if you go to even lower level, like articulatory stuff, you see this more local circuit that involves somatosensory and motor cortex. So the basic idea is you can think of these circuits as being, to some extent, um, hierarchically organized in terms of their fronto-posterior uh, arrangement, um, uh, which kind of makes sense if you think of the nervous system as basically uh, hierarchies of sensory motor interaction systems at, at some level, where the highest level is not obviously sensory motor, it's something a bit more abstract. Um, okay, and that's, uh, I want to acknowledge all of my collaborators, which include a lot of people. This is by no means my own uh, work alone. Um, and, of course, my funding sources. Thank you very much. Actually, I have two different questions I'm going to ask you, and I'm trying to decide which one I'm more curious about. So, okay, so I, I think I've picked. So um, in the, sort of the second half of your talk, where you spent a lot of time talking about speech production, you invoke these concepts of like prediction and forward modeling that are very sort of trendy in psycholinguistics generally, as, as you know. In the first part of your talk, I was really intrigued when you talked about your skepticism concerning motor, uh, mirror neurons and the notion that um, when people, that the motor systems are crucially involved in comprehension of language. And that got me all excited. I thought, oh, Greg is going to tell us how skeptical he is about theories that invoke you know, forward modeling and prediction and um, analysis by synthesis and those kinds of accounts of comprehension, you know, all the way to like Pickering and Garrett kinds of approaches that talk a lot about uh, simula simulating the interlocutor you know, in a converse. And so, so I was just wondering, those two parts, are you sort of interested in the idea that the, per the, comprehend the perception systems involved in production but not the other way? Is that how I put these two parts of your talk together? Yeah, so you'll be happy to know that your initial excitement over my skepticism is, is well-founded. I'm still skeptical that this predictive coding mechanism <laughs> can be used to enhance perception. So the basic idea is, it's an interesting idea. So people, people like you're referring to have, have largely abandoned the strong version of a mirror neuron claim, which is that that motor system is necessary for comprehension or perception. Okay. Now what people are talking about is, can it modulate perception? So this is a little different. So the idea is that perception or recognition is happening in the ventral stream. But that motor information is really useful in modulating that system to help augment perception. That's a reasonable idea. It's an empirical question that just needs to be investigated. I'm deeply skeptical that it's actually going to work. Um, because uh, for a couple of reasons, um, I actually propose this as a possible mechanism for why you can see under some conditions a modulation, small 
scale modulations of perception with motor manipulation. Um, and, and it was basically in the context of this predictive coding. If you already have a system that is set up to take a motor plan and modulate perception, um, computation, we think of it as a suppression, then that could be co-opted or ex-opted in evolutionary terms to uh, help out with perceptions. It's a reasonable idea. Um, I don't think it's right because uh, conceptually, um, if you think about what in the motor context, what predictive coding is doing. So computationally, the way we usually think about it is it's a suppression signal. So you have, uh, you have a motor plan that you expect through past learning to generate a sensory response. Then you get a predictive signal that, that basically modulates that. The way that's usually modulated is it's suppressed so that when the actual thing comes in, it cancels. Okay, so you think of psychotic suppression, where we don't, see our, we don't see the world moving when we move our eyes, even though it's sweeping past our retina. The explanation for that is a suppression signal is sent back to motion areas, which say, don't, ex don't interpret this as movement, uh, as actual movement of the world, it's just your eye moving. It suppresses that sensory signal. So motor prediction is essentially a way of squashing perception unless it's deviation. If it's deviation, now you're gonna see a big signal because you didn't hit that suppressed target. You hit something else and now you've got an error signal that can then propagate up to the motor system. So if this were gonna work, you would have to be predicting something that isn't matching what you're predicting so that you're detecting a mismatch, which could be possible, but it's something that people don't work out. Um, there's other reasons I think that uh, this is wrong, but um, that's kind of, the reason for my initial skepticism. So you're skeptical about embodiment as well? Oh, yeah. Um, have you looked at, look at the specific area in the fair band that uh, uh, provides uh, uh, feedback for speech? Specific areas of the cerebellum. No, I'm, I'm really a newbie in the cerebellum, so to me it's just one big lump of brain. Um, uh, I'm sh I know that there's a lot of structure in there, and it's something that we want to work out, and. Um, you know, I'm working with people who are better experts at this than I am, but I, I have not myself. Sorry. So my question's been evolving while I've been waiting for the mic, and I'm trying to think about what your efference copy dynamics are. This, because rehearsing phenomenologically the same auditory token won't be the same as the influential neural activity that might be making these corrections because that's happening very quickly and probably not accessible to conscious um, experience. So can you talk about the relationship between conscious rehearsal versus the error correction that you're hypothesizing and what that might look like in terms of its temporal dynamics? Uh, the our conscious rehearsal task is a very weak hack at trying to identify the basic components of the system. It's not a natural thing necessarily, and it, but it was the best we could come up with to try to map the basic components. So we use it because it works to identify the circuit, that, but it is, I, uh, I agree, completely different than what's happening when you're doing this internal error correction, um, which is automatic, unconscious, um, and is not something you know. It's not something you think about when you're when you're doing it. The dynamics I've worked a little bit computationally on what the dynamics might look like. Um, and if you you know, I've modeled that network very simply. Um, and basically, the idea is you activate both motor and uh, auditory systems. You have inhibitory signals going back to the auditory, uh, excitatory signals going in this direction. When when these signals cancel, you keep that then basically there's no more correction signals coming into the motor system and it's allowed to, to fire. When these signals don't cancel, like when this is making an error compared to what's being activated here, this target is gonna continue to activate this system which automatically functions as an error, correct, as an error signal. It's just excitatory input, which is the error. So you can think of it very simply in terms of those kinds of dynamics. And um, in one of the papers that was was shown up here. Um, I have a very simple model to show that it actually works uh, um, computationally when you implement it. Uh, you touched uh, at the beginning of your presentation on it. Um, so what do we know about 
are there any cultural, non-cultural correlates to the emergence of language 1.7 billion years ago? Um, no, I'm not an expert on the origin of human language, and I would probably, I would argue that no one is, it, it, even people who study it. It's a really hard thing to study because you don't have a fossil record. You, know, you do have some evidence from looking at intracranial fossils because you get changes in brain morphology in modern humans that you can look at. But it turns out to be a really hard, study, a hard thing to study. Um, of course, we assume that it was in place when Homo sapiens, the earliest date of the origin of Homo sapiens, so a couple hundred thousand years ago. Um, and presumably, there was some rudiments of it before that. And I, to be honest, I'm not sure what's driving those estimates. But that's the earliest estimate that we have, that 1.75 million years ago. Um, I ne wouldn't necessarily um, trust it. I think it could move around a whole lot um, if we were able to find a decent method for estimating that. The point, though, was that by the time it evolved relatively late in, uh, in uh, our evolution, uh, compared to all this other stuff like vision and hearing and presumably other cognitive abilities. So we can assume that it evolved on top of a lot of other cognitive uh, perceptual motor mechanisms. That's the main point. I'm performing cyber tracking using a TI, and uh, Arctic fasciculus is one of the uh, structures that I'm very interested in. And I have uh, reconstructed a lot of uh, Arctic fasciculus, uh, reconstructed this fiber tracking a lot of subjects, and noticed that uh, the left Arctic fasciculus is much more uh, prominent than the right hemisphere, uh, uh, Arctic, right uh, Arctic. Arctic Okay, That's a sensory motor <laughs> thing. <laughs> so I just want to know whether uh, this uh, phenomenon is related to uh, language processing in the left and the right hemisphere. Yeah, I would guess since this sensory motor circuit is left dominant that you would expect to see. And it, speech motor control is a really complicated thing. We're doing a lot of <coughs> intricate stuff in our vocal tracts to coordinate this speech virtually error free, you know, 1% of the time we make errors under non-stressed giving a talk situation. Um, and it's amazing that we can do it. So there's gonna be some pretty heavy duty neural machinery behind it and a thickening of the, the arcuofasciculus, those tracks that are coordinating this would be expected, I think, absolutely. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.